Word embedding is used to represent words and texts as numerical vectors. It helps convert complex data, such as text, into a format that machine learning algorithms can easily understand and process. The most exciting thing about this concept is that when you convert words and phrases into a numerical representation, numerically similar words are also similar in meaning. This allows us to build things like a search engine with an exciting level of precision. This video will explore a semantic search using OpenAI's embeddings. So, how does this search mechanism work? How do you convert these words and phrases into numbers to perform classification, anomaly detection, clustering, and so on? Well, I prepared this notebook about word embeddings. Now we will see how, how this works the mathematics behind it in a way you can understand and apply. I will leave a link to this example in the video description. Well, we first need to install the OpenAI package. The next step here is to import the necessary Python packages. So besides importing the OpenAI package, I will need pandas and numpy. Here I need to set up the OpenAI API key. I will generate a new API key and store it in the .em file. And that's it for now. I will start with a simple list of words to ensure a clear understanding of this concept and how it works. So this is the CSV file of words. We have words like french fries, soda, hamburger, cheesecake, mocha, banana, coffee, so on. I will load this CSV file into a pandas data frame, KLEDDF. The next thing we will do is calculate the word embeddings. In other terms, this means converting these words into vectors. Then, what I'm going to do here is use the OpenAI embeddings model for this task. You can check the OpenAI documentation. There is an entire section about embeddings with more details and examples. But let's continue. When sending a request to the API with a word, I receive this large vector with a series of numbers as a return. For our example, instead of using this API request in this way, we will create a function called get embedding. This way, I can pass a list of words, call the function get embedding, and choose a model. As options, we have a few models here, but for this text embeddings, we will use the most recent model, text embedding 3 small. So I'm going to type cappuccino. When running this, the function sends the string and converts this word, cappuccino, into a vector. And we have this absurd amount of numbers that the model returns. I will do the same thing in the data frame, generating vectors for all the words. I have a total of 26 words. I want to convert all of them at once and create a new column with all the vectors right next to them. So I will take the data frame and create a new column called embedding. And within this new column, what I'm going to do is store the result of this operation. For this, I use the apply function that iterates on each element of the text column and will apply a lambda function to each element. Remember that lambda is an anonymous function that receives a single argument and executes a single expression. In this case, the function get embedding. This line of code applies the function get embedding to each element of the text column. As a result, an extensive list of numbers is associated with each word in this data frame. Great, Daniel, but what can I do with this? Well, this is the part where things get interesting. Since we initially generated its embedding, I will use cappuccino as a search term. Just remind you that cappuccino doesn't appear on this list. And then with this numerical vector, I will look for a similarity in the numerical representations of all these older words we have started in the data frame. That is, I want to find out which vectors are the closest to the vector of the word cappuccino. That is, we are going to do a similarity search. To do this, the model calculates a similarity measure between two vectors 
vectors. And in this example, we use a cosine similarity measure. This mathematical formula calculates the similarity between two sequences of numbers. It is described by this equation. The cosine similarity is obtained by dividing the dot product of the two vectors by the magnitudes of these vectors. This notation may seem complicated or very simple, depending on your mathematics level. But I guarantee you that this is just multiplication. In simple terms, this upper term here is a dot product, which is obtained by adding the products of the corresponding elements of the vectors. The goal is to multiply each of the terms in the two vectors. Suppose you have this equation here with two vectors, where the first vector, v1, contains the numbers 1, 2, and 3, and the second vector, or v2, has the numbers 4, 5, and 6. So the calculation is 1 times 4 plus 2 times 5 plus 3 times 6, and as a result, we have the dot product. In Python, we can use NumPy to do this, getting the same result, 32. And then, in the bottom part of the equation, we need to calculate the magnitude. The magnitude of a vector is a scalar value that represents the size or length of the vector. It is calculated by taking the square root of the sum of the squares of its elements. That is 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, then we have 14. I calculate the square root of that, which as a result we get 3.74. I do this on v2 by multiplying the 2 and having the magnitude. And I need to divide the dot product by the magnitude to get the similarity, which in this case is 0.97. In the end, everything is just a sum of several multiplications. You can even take these numbers here and plot them on a 3D vector. If I put 1, 2, and 3 here as a vector and 4, 5, and 6 and draw, you can see they are very close. Returning to words, we are taking a vectorial representation of all these different words and seeing how close they are in space. Of course, it is difficult to perform this calculation manually with this number of digits. Fortunately, a cosine similarity function will perform this calculation through all these numbers. So we can sort all these different vectors in space and find out which vector is closest to the cappuccino word. We will take this cosine similarity function and apply it to each vector in our data frame. That is, we will check the distance between these vectors and the vector for a cappuccino. So we run this calculation and store the result in a new column called similarities. And finally, we sort in descending order by the similarities column. As a result, we have the words most similar to cappuccino. In this case, espresso, mocha, coffee, and latte. It makes total sense. If you are interested in this topic and want to know more about how embeddings works and how these models understand the meaning of words, leave a message in the comments. Now, thinking about this, you are developing an intelligent assistant similar to ChatGPT, focusing on a specific domain inside a business. Well, these models need to know as much as possible about your operations. But most companies have a lot of information and putting everything together in a single context, in a single request, is impractical. Another problem in this kind of application is that in conversations, users generally do not ask questions based on specific keywords as they do on Google. Instead, they ask questions that express a specific meaning or intention. This means that traditional search algorithms are inefficient with this type of query. And this is where solutions like Quadrant come into play. Imagine making embeddings of phrases, paragraphs, or even entire books and storing them in a database. This type of database allows you to vastly expand the knowledge base of your chatbot or application with your customized data. In this particular example, I could have opted 
that for a book as a source of information. Still, I have chosen to use a document the video's sponsor provided, but as the sponsor is myself, I will use my resume as the document. The idea is to vectorize the entire content to make similarity queries and use the result as context in the prompts. After importing the necessary packages, I must ensure the document's content does not exceed the LLM token limit. For that, the strategy is to divide the document into smaller parts. It's a good practice to divide the documents into semantically relevant chunks. Paragraphs usually work well. Here, each chunk will be used to generate an embedding. First, I load and read the PDF file. Then I extract all the text and divide it into smaller chunks, each containing 500 characters. And then these parts are stored in a list. Now the embeddings can be generated using OpenAI's text embedding tree small model. For this, I follow the structure of points from Quadrant. Points are the central entity that Quadrant operates, where a point is a record consisting of a vector. With this done, the next step is to load the data into the database. In this case, the vectors or points in Quadrant. I could run Quadrant locally with Docker, but I will cover that in another video. In this example, we will explore the cloud solution. After creating an account, a new cluster, and copying the API key from the platform, I can build a new collection. Finally, the data is sent to the collection through the upsort method. We can check on the platform and see that the chunks have been stored. Now that the data is loaded, I can run some sample queries to find the most relevant documents to answer questions. But first, I need to generate an embedding of the question itself. Then I can perform a similarity search that compares the questions embedding with all other vectors in the quadrant collection. The limit parameter defines how many similar results will be returned, in this case, just three. The last step is to use the results as context in a prompt for requests to the LLM. So I asked how many years of experience does Daniel have? And when did Daniel shift to machine learning? As expected, the result is very fair. If we compare it with the resumes content, we will see that the context was successfully used. The entire approach we have seen here is known as retrieval augmented generation or RAG, where projects with a knowledge base on a specific domains through a vector database like Quadrant make similarity queries with well-designed prompts. I will bring more videos about RAG in the future. That's it for today and if you have any further questions, please let me know.